Greetings. There were three men who, uh, whose wives were about to have children and they opted to be in a waiting room. A nurse came out and told the first man, congratulations, your wife has given birth to twins. And he, he said, well, that's really interesting. I work for the Minnesota Twins. A few minutes later, the nurse came back to, the, to another man uh, waiting there and she said, wow, your wife has given birth to triplets. And the man said, well, that's amazing. I work for 3M. The third man put on his coat and started walking out. And uh, the nurse said to him, why, why are you walking out? He said, I work for 7up. The reason I told that joke, you'll see as we go through this uh, discussion today. I'm speaking on Veterans Day of 2022, when I was a little boy in America, it was Armistice Day and then it was changed to Veterans Day. In some countries, it's still mainly focused on the, the end of the First World War. It was called then the Great War. It ended at the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, the truce. And that was, of course, supposed to be the Great War, and there weren't going to be world wars after that. But unfortunately, that obviously was not the case. This world will truly know peace when God rules this world directly with the resurrection uh, and under Jesus Christ, the returned Jesus Christ will be the resurrected saints. Then this world will know uh, a condition Going back to the Garden of Eden, it will be an earthly paradise at that point. Until that time, you know, we struggle along uh, and uh, governments do as best they can, hopefully. In some cases, they, uh, they uh, are oppressive, but in other cases, they are trying at least to do, to, to do the best for their people. But we won't reach really the, the ideal until the second coming of Christ, and I'll say more about that in a moment. In fact, I'll give the title of my message today. It is praise for the for God's kingdom, or praises, I'll say, praises for God's kingdom. Uh, I wanted to focus on a couple of psalms that relate to this coming kingdom of God, this coming millennium, this coming messianic age, the wonderful world tomorrow, the awesome age ahead. There are a couple of psalms I wanted to go over today to relate to that. Uh, in, in Ephesians 5 and verse 18, we're told, And do not be drunk with wine. Now, it's one, wonderful to drink wine, but not to be drunk. And do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to another, to one another in psalms, in hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Well, I do want to at least read a couple of psalms to you today and discuss them. Uh, I want to now go to uh, the book of James, the fifth chapter, and verse 13. James 5, 13. Is anyone among of you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. So today we're going. I want to go over a couple of psalms that relate to the coming kingdom of God and... You know, in uh, Matthew, the sixth chapter, uh, and it's also found elsewhere, but I want to go to the Matthew 6 and verse 10. Here we're given an outline about what to pray about. And of course, as after we address our celestial Father, then we pray, Your kingdom come. In verse 10 of Matthew 6, Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come. This is a prayer we need to be very much a part of our prayer life. The fourth book of Psalms has a, a, a strong association with the, the coming kingdom of God, and it is, in effect, seasonally uh, very much related to the autumn of the year and the festivals that picture uh, the, the judgment of, man, of humankind, the second coming of Christ, the millennium and, and beyond. That fourth book of Psalms relates a lot to it, to that, to that autumn festival season. And also, each Sabbath, 
the fourth book of Psalms is something that we would be inspired to, to read on the Sabbath. In fact, Psalm 92 is a Psalm for the Sabbath day. And if you were, were a regular synagogue goer, you would see that on Friday evening and then again uh, during the day on, on uh, uh, Saturday mo morning, uh, a, a lot of that fourth book of Psalms uh, will, will be recited. I want to go to the 96th. And I am going to keep a, uh, a Hebrew version as well with me here. Uh, let's go to the 96th Psalm. And uh, you'll see that indeed a lot of these Psalms, if you read them, do relate to the coming kingdom of God. He does uh, uh, intend to directly intervene in human affairs. Jesus Christ came at first to be a sacrificial lamb, but he's coming uh, uh, eventually as the line of the tribe of Judah to rule and the resurrected saints under him. A song of, uh, so let's go to uh, Psalm 96. Oh, sing to the eternal a new song, uh, or sing to the Lord, I'll say Lord here, but it is, of course, when you see it in all caps here, it is yud Hey vav Hey, the tetragrammaton. Uh, oh, sing to the Lord a new song, sing to the Lord all the earth, sing to the Lord, bless his name, proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. Proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. And this is, of course, the responsibility of the ministry to do. It is the responsibility of God's church to proclaim, you know, the good news of uh, his salvation from day to day. This is, of course, the great commission of the church, as we know. And just to review, uh, what what is the the good news? Uh, I want to go back to the Gospel of Mark and um, how it begins and then how it defines the good news later on in that same chapter. I'll go to Mark 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, uh, and uh, of course, Jesus Christ is the central personality of this good news. The good news cannot be really given without, without reference to Jesus Christ. And what is Jesus Christ going to do? Well, in verse 14, we see that now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. His human ministry was, not, was now beginning and he was calling out a church to uh, prepare to become kings and priests under him when he returns, and in the meantime to, to preach the gospel over, over the uh, centuries. So I want to go now uh, back to uh, Psalm 96. And uh, while I'm going back to Psalm 96, some of you may be clicking on your device or, or turning pages. Uh, I want to mention that a kingdom, of course, has four elements. You, you have the king, Jesus Christ. You have the... Uh, the subjects, which is eventually the whole human race. You have the uh, laws, which is going to be <laughs> the word of God, <clears throat> you know, and then, of course, you have the territory, which is the whole world, ultimately. Uh, so we continue on now in Psalm 96. Declare his glory among the nations, his wonders among all peoples. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He's also to be feared above all gods. So anything, any power, any source of power in the world, you know, any God with a small g, you know, he's greater than them all. And of course, there are many deities that have been worshipped over the centuries by various peoples that, of course, you know, are either, uh, you know, they may have been uh, indirectly worshipping <laughs> demonic beings or, or just nothing. Uh, but all the gods of the people are idols, but the, uh, the eternal made the heavens. And this term, uh, I believe, is the uh, Hebrew. I'm, I'm going back now to it. He called it Heamim Elilim. They're they're all like like uh, nothing nothingnesses, you know. The, 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 and uh, it's a play on words on the word for not in Hebrew and the word which is Al 
you know, don't do this, don't do that is in Hebrew al, and the word el is the word for God, and these are elilim. So these are, in effect, one commentator, very scholarly commentator, said these are the ungods. <laughs> And that's why later earlier I gave you a story about seven up the uncola. <laughs> These are the ungods, the Elilim. Uh, okay, so anyway, uh, I'm reading in uh, in verse five. For all the gods of the peoples are idols, but the eternal may, uh, may, but the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before Him. Strength and beauty are in His sanctuary. And now we have this is poetry, of course. Uh, the Psalms are, are, are poetry, and there's all kinds of elements of the poetry, and one of them is occasionally the repetition of a key word, uh, which, which, they, which is called palological par parallelism. You know, you have key words repeated. Give to the eternal, and give to, give to the Lord, give to the Lord, give to the Lord, in these two verses. And it kind of builds to a climax. Give to the Lord, O families of the peoples, give to the Lord glory and strength, Give to the, to the Lord the glory uh, do his name, you know, so, which is, of course, beyond what we can, we can really do, but we can try, right? Bring an offering and come into his courts, or worship the, the Lord in the beauty of holiness, tremble before him all the earth. When we talk about the name of the Lord, of course, we're talking about all that implies, uh, you know, his authority and, and his, and his character, and, uh, in the Bible, the, the, uh, God goes by f various names, uh, and I would say that that it, you it, it, you can you can basically think in terms of eight. You know, seven is is, is God's number of completeness, and eighth is his num is his number of superabundance. And so we have, I would say, a family of names. The, the Jews have substituted for God's name, Y-H-W-H, uh, they have substituted for that the word Adonai, uh, which is an exalted term for Lord. Uh, and, 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 uh, but when, when, it's, uh, when it's pronounced, uh, when, when we come to his name, Y-H-W-H, in the, in, the, uh, in the Hebrew, by, in, in your translation, it's capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. And so it's going back to Y-H-W-H. And sometimes he is called Adonai in the Hebrew, and then it just spells it L-O-R-D, you know, not in all caps. And uh, the, the tradition of using Adonai for the Tetragrammaton is honored in the New Testament. When the New Testament speakers came to that word, they used the Greek word kurios, you know, and I think coming from the Septuagint translation, you know, they just use that term, uh, the equivalent of, of Adonai, rather than, you know, attempting to transliterate the term into, into Greek. Uh, and this is really for the best, if you think about it. Because if you look at the world today, uh, today we're not worried about Zeus and, and uh, Jupiter and this and that and the other deity. Uh, generally, the world knows about the one God and has some concept of that. You know, we have Christianity, Judaism, Islam, and and uh, generally speaking, if you tell somebody anywhere in the world, I believe in God, he'll have a certain general concept of what you mean, rather than using a specific Hebrew word that kind of limit. In a, in, in a way, in a way, it's it, it makes it more of an ethnic thing than a user, than a universal thing. Uh, but in any case, uh, as I said, in the original Hebrew, there are in effect eight names. And there, let's first talk about the Elohim family. You know, God has the, 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 the power, the might, the force, um, as it were. Not that I want to get into the uh, science fiction area here, but um, let's go to uh, Psalm 83. Psalm 83. And here we have two terms uh, that relate to God as 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 power and might. Um, uh, psalm 83, in the beginning of that psalm, uh, it says, uh, Do not keep silent, a song of a, a psalm of Asaph, do not keep silent, O God, and that is the word Elohim. And of course, when it's referring to God, it's singular. So he does it, he creates. In the begin beginning, God created, he created Elohim. Think of the word in English species. There's, species could be one, 
species. There could be many species. You have to go by context. So when the Bible speaks of God as Elohim, he does this, he does that, because there's only one God, and his, one of his names is Elohim. So do not uh, keep silent, O God. Do not hold your peace, and do not be still, O God. There, the word is El. Uh, so Elohim is one word for God, another word is El. And Elohim, in a sense, is plural of the word Eloah. And that is a more poetic term, but you do find it, of course. And uh, I want to go to Psalm 114, uh, and there it says, uh, verse 7, Tremble, O earth, at the presence of the Lord. Uh, at the pre Okay, this translation... Okay, yes, uh, it, the Hebrew is, the word order is a little different in Hebrew, but the word for our Lord here is, is Adonai, so that's why it's not in all caps. Tremble alert at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob, and that word for God is Eloah. So you have the Elohim family, you have El, Eloah, Elohim. All right, so that's three names. And then you have uh, the Adonai family, as I've said, and uh, you saw it there, but I want to go to Psalm 130. And in Psalm 130, and that emphasizes God as the self-existent one, he who causes to be, you know, and uh, some, some translations prefer the eternal. He's the self-existent one, he causes to be. It is based upon the verb to be. He is, he was, he will be. You know, uh, I, I will be what I will be, or I am that I am. Remember, he talked to Moses. Uh, and um, in Psalm 130, uh, it says, I, Out of the depths I have called to you, O Lord, and that is Y-H-W-H, -H, you know. And then he says, Lord, hear my voice, uh, and that is Adonai. And then, later on, we have another form of, of Lord. Um, if you, Lord, should mark iniquities, uh, O Lord, who could stand? But the first Lord is in all caps, but it is not Y-H-W-H, it's a shorter form, Yah. Just, you could spell it Y-A-H. So you have the form Yahweh, Yah, and Adonai. That's another family. I, I know in Jamaica, it's very popular, I think, to speak of God as, as Jah, J-A-H. I think that's a popular term that they use in Jamaica. So we have the Elohim family. We have El, Eloah, Elohim. Then we have the Adonai family, uh, Yahweh, Yah, and Adonai. Okay, but there is also uh, another term for God, which is found in Psalm 91. And that's a more complex term in terms of what it actually means. It's often translated the Almighty. I speculate that it, it, it meant uh, the Great Spirit might have been the meaning of it. That term that is used in <clears throat> by Native Americans. Uh, and anyway, in Psalm 91, um, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty, and that is Shaddai. Sometimes he's called Shaddai or he's called El Shaddai. And it's often translated as God Almighty. Uh, so Shaddai is another name of God, and there are various interpretations of it, and all of whom, all of which may may be correct in some sense. But I, I think of it as the Great Spirit. Uh, but also, there's another term for God that is here, and I think of that as the eighth one. You know, in other words, we have the complete list of names, but then and Shaddai being the seventh. But now we have the eighth, Elyon, the Most High. So God is also called Elyon. In fact, the Psalm of the Sabbath day talks of God as Elyon, if you look at Psalm 92. And he who dwells in the secret place of Elyon, of the Most High. So I've given you the, the eight names that are really the basic names of God in the, in the original Hebrew. Uh, and you could, one could go on and on about that. So let's go back to, now to Psalm 96. Um, and I, I, I'll pick it up in verse 9. I may have read it already. Well, I'll pick it up in verse 8. Give to the eternal the glory due his name. <laughs> Bring an offering and come in, into his court. So worship the eternal in the beauty of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations the eternal reigns. This is the goal. This is our hope, our dream. And we know it's true. 
<laughs> uh, it will happen. Say among the nations, the, the Lord reigns. The world also is firmly established and shall not be moved. He shall judge the peoples righteously. Now, that is the condition the world is going to come to. That's not the condition of the world right now. Every Tuesday in the temple, uh, they would read Psalm 82. And uh, there it says in verse 5, uh, speaking of the rulers of this world, and unfortunately, you know, if the, if the shoe fits, wear it. You know what I'm saying? Those who are in charge, if the shoe fits, wear it. They do not know, nor do they understand. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are unstable. <laughs> That's the condition of the world as it is now. But it's not going to always be that way. It's going to be ultimately on a firm foundation. The, the word of God. And here in verse 10, we read it. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The world also is firmly established. It shall not be moved. He shall judge the peoples righteously. You have something similar in Psalm 93. Uh, anyway, verse 11. Let the heavens rejoice and let the earth be glad. Let the sea in all its fullness. If I were inclined to sing, I would like to sing the Hebrew version of this. You know, Yismechu Hashamayim. Very nice song. But what's beautiful about this verse, in verse 11 it's seven Hebrew words, and the first four are an acrostic. The first word begins with Yud, the next word begins with He, the next word, verb begins with Vav, the next verb begins with He. So we have God's personal name, the Tetragrammaton, spelled out. Yismuchu HaShemayim V'tagel Ha'aretz. And then, Yeram Hayam Umlo'o, let the sea roar in all its fullness. And that those three words begin with Yud, He, and Vav, so that is the form Yahu, you know, that's an acrostic for another form of God's name that you find in Yirmiyahu, Jeremiah, Yeshayahu, Isaiah, Matityahu, Mattathias. So this is really a beautiful verse in the original. And then it goes on, let the field be joyful in all that is in it. Let all, then all the trees of the woods will rejoice before the Lord. So God is coming also to save the environment of the earth because, you know, war is obviously devastating to environment. And unfortunately, there's going to be a lot of war before God, before Jesus Christ returns, sad to say. Uh, verse uh, 13, um, let's go back to verse 12. Let the joy, see, field be joyful in all that is in it. Then Lord, all the fields of the, uh, uh, all the trees of the woods will rejoice. And verse 13, before the Lord, for he is coming, for he is coming to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with his truth. A better translation for that would be in faithfulness. Let me see what the, how the Hebrew translates it. Let me re read from a Hebrew transla English translation. At the presence of the Lord, for he is coming, for he is coming to rule the earth. He will rule the world justly and its peoples in faithfulness. Bemunato, in his faithfulness, is, is even a better translation than what they have. In his faithfulness he is faithful he's promised to set up his kingdom on earth jesus promised to return and he will so i want to go on out of psalm 97 and uh, again this relates to to the coming kingdom of god and it puts us in a proper mood for the sabbath you know as we keep the sabbath from week to week we're reminded that ultimately the world will know rest rest from its torments of today, of the various problems that afflict humankind. There will be a time of rest. And uh, in Hebrews 4 and verse 9, uh, we're told, uh, there remains, therefore, sabbatismos, a, a rest for the people of God. And, uh, you know, we're, we're, he's talking there about the, the Messianic age, the millennium, the kingdom of God. The king, you know, when, when, when the God's people uh, have gone from physical to spirit, you know, and are living on that level, you know, that is obviously a rest from the uh, toils of being physical. And the sap from, as we keep the Sabbath from week to week, we're looking forward to that. But in Psalm 97, uh, I want to, uh, to jump and, and notice... It's, it, it talks about a fire goes before him and burns up his enemies round about. He is going to deal with those who oppose him, with the wicked who oppose him. 
His lightnings light the world. The earth sees and trembles. So we have God as, as, as we know, he's pictured as fire, as light. Here is, he's, we hear of lightning. And at the end, we see light again. Uh, light is sown for the righteous. So we have that theme. Uh, I want to uh, go to uh, verse um, 10. As, as we think about God's kingdom, uh, let's go to the book of Ezekiel. You know, we can take for granted the way things are and kind of uh, get complacent about it, and we shouldn't because sin is very self-destructive. Sin damages uh, the sinner and those around the sinner. And, you know, ultimately this world would destroy itself if God you know, were not to intervene. Uh, and... Um, uh, let's go to verse 3 of Ezekiel 9. Now the glory of God of, of the God of Israel had gone up from the cherub where it had been to the threshold of the temple, and he called to the man clothed with linen who had the writer's inkhorn at his side. And the Lord said to him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and put a mark on the thresholds of, uh, the thresholds of the men who sigh and cry over all the abominations that are done within it. Let's, re let's keep a high standard. Let's be firmly rooted in God's word and not compromise with it and not just go with the flow with the way things are in this world because right now in many countries we're in a period where standards are in many areas of life are deteriorating. Uh, speech is getting more coarse <coughs> excuse me and um, there's just a, 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 there's, there's just a, a lowering of standards in many ways uh, in many in many areas that are hearing my voice at this time that are seeing me it, it is for us you know to to maintain the standards that we know God would have us to maintain and and to be concerned for what's happening around us because ultimately we know it, it, it hurts people it, it hurts the one the ones who who practice the, the, this kind of behavior and it hurts others around them and it, it does lead to self-destruction so we're told here in verse uh, 10 you who love the lord hate evil not not hate people but hate evil you who hate the lord hate evil he preserves the souls of his saints he delivers them from the hand of the wicked ultimately you know, if you stick with it, you know, then you'll be ruling over this world and you'll be able to therefore serve humankind. You will have the power to really make a difference, a difference that will make you a, for a blessing to others. You who love the Lord hate evil. He preserves the souls of, of his saints. He delivers them out of the hand of the wicked. Light is sown for the righteous and gladness for the upright in heart. Again, I could break into song. Uh, some of you may have seen a movie, and I'm not saying that it's a millennial movie, but <laughs> some of you may have seen a comedy called The Frisco Kid about a Polish rabbi who has to travel from, uh, to, from Poland to America and then from Philadelphia to uh, San Francisco. And he's, in, in, he's with a group of American Indians and uh, he's, teach, he's, he's, teach, he's singing to them, and he sings this uh, verse. But light is sown for the righteous, and gladness for the upright in heart. And so again, you know, we are to be the light of the world, as Jesus said. You know, we're to be salt of the earth and the light of the world. And Jesus, of course, is the great light uh, of the world. Light is sown for the righteous, and gladness for the upright in heart. Ultimately, our, our future will be certainly a joyful one, and the Sabbath is intended to be a delightful day for us. Uh, light is sown for the righteous and gladness for the upright in heart. Rejoice in the eternal, you righteous, and give thanks at the remembrance of his, of his holy name. Uh, actually, the, uh, the, 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 the text is at the remembrance of his holiness, the Zecher Kod Show at the remembrance of his holiness. That's probably how it's going to be translated in the Hebrew version. Um, well, no, here it also says holy name, but the word name isn't there. Not that, that that's a problem, but and give thanks at the remembrance of his holiness. Just remembering his holiness uh, uh, is, is, uh, is certainly something that we can be thankful about. 
We can be thankful that he is who he is. We, we, we can be thankful that he is and that he is who he is. Now here we read, light is sown for the righteous and gladness for the upright in heart. So as we live righteously, we're preparing to be lights and we're preparing to be, as Daniel said, you know, to shine uh, as spirit beings, to, to shine like the stars. Uh, and uh, if we look at the book of James, I believe that he's elaborating on this verse. I want to go to the end of the third chapter of James. So here we see, Or zarur lat tzaddik, uli yishrei lev simcha. Light is home for the righteous, and gladness for the upright in heart. And uh, at the end of the book of James, um, it says, Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So light is sown for the righteous, and, and how, how is righteousness sown? You know, how, how does righteousness uh, begin so that you can have the light? Uh, it says, Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So uh, what comes from righteousness comes because righteous people are peacemakers. We should be, as Christians, peaceable people. We should not be people who stir up strife. Uh, in our daily lives, in the way we treat uh, others, uh, we, we should be uh, promoting peace with others. And we, uh, we should be careful how we address others, how we deal with others. Uh, I want to go to Matthew, the fifth chapter, uh, and uh, the famous uh, so-called Sermon on the Mount. And um, I want to go to five, and uh, I want to go to verse... Um, Verse 9, blessed, and this word blessed is, I think the word in Greek is makarios. It's like the term ashrei in Hebrew, and it, it means blessed and happy in effect, fortunate. It's a, it's a, it's a very wonderful term. Uh, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God, or, you know, children of God. You know, so if we're going to be godly, we're going to be peaceable people. Uh, uh, in other words, our, our goal will be to keep keep peace, not not to stir up strife. We're not going to be troublemakers, as it were. Now, obviously, just just being Christian will invite persecution at times. So, but you know, let it come. Let, let the trouble be because we're doing the right thing. Uh, you know, let, let's not be the, the in effect the, the source of the trouble. Let the trouble come because they they're not appreciating the fact that we're being righteous. You know, let that be the problem rather than 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 uh, we being the problem. So I want to go now to Matthew again. I was in Matthew already. I should have stayed there, but uh, let me go back to Matthew uh, again to the Sermon on the Mount to the sixth chapter. Matthew 6 and verse 33, because today I read a couple of Psalms that I think are very appropriate for the Sabbath day and for the autumn of the year, and they're associated with God's kingdom, and they're associated with praising God's kingdom, looking forward to it. To it. What a wonderful time that will be, and obviously, you know, we want to be there, and we want to help others to be there, and uh, in uh, Matthew 6 and verse 33, we're told but seek first. Let me let me just go to Psalm 27 along those lines. Since I've been reading Psalms, I want to go to Psalm 27. Now hold, hold the place in Matthew 6. I used to tell people with one hand, you know, hold this place. With the other, hold the other place. And with the third, take notes. But that won't work. Anyway, but now that we have devices, I guess you can work all kinds of things out. But let's go to Psalm 27, way back here in the Old Testament, in the uh, fourth verse, David says, One thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. So this was David's greatest you know, goal, his, his dream, his hope, to be in God's kingdom. And uh, he set the pattern that we should follow that Jesus Christ tells us in Matthew 6, 33. 
Let's go back there now. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Ultimately, God wants to give to his people, under him, rule over the entire universe. So there are many Psalms that emphasize the positive experience that it will be for people when they when finally Jesus Christ does return to rule this world. <clears throat> Pardon me, when the saints are resurrected and our kings and priests in that kingdom, it will be, of course, uh, the culmination of God's plan, and then it will go from there even greater and greater and greater. You know, and many of these points I, w I hope were covered at your various festival sites that you attended. What God has in store for humanity, which we can we can only have a, a, a partial picture, as Paul said, you know, we, we, we don't fully understand now, but what we do understand is so inspiring, and we certainly look forward to it, and as I say, each day we pray, your kingdom come, so Linda and I certainly want to be in the kingdom of God, and we hope that those of you who are viewing this message will, will also be there with us, and so today I have uh, read and discussed praises for the kingdom of God, praises for God's kingdom. All the best to you and yours.